Hi, welcome to this new lecture. It's good to be with you again in a quiet moment of the day. It does not matter um, if it's not exactly the same moment or the same day for me and for you. It is anyway a brief pause from the fretting world and a short mental journey through space and time. In the last two lectures, we have seen the Islamic conquests in Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Regions that within a decades the Arabs had taken away from the two major empires of the late antiquity. Already on in the same year of the conquest of Alexandria, 642, Amr bin al-As undertook an expedition in the direction of Carthage. To the west of Egypt stretched territories unknown to the Arabs and different from Egypt under all respects. Let us have a look at them now. From Alexandria to the next major city, Carthage, capital of the Byzantine Exarchate of Africa, there are over 2,500 kilometers. West of Alexandria, after a very long stretch of desert, lay the region of Cyrenaica, which forms today the eastern part of Libya. On the western side of it rose Directly on the coast, the great massif of the Jabal Akhtar, the Green Mountain, attracting enough rain for some Mediterranean woodland and agriculture. This relatively fertile area was also known as the Pentapolis because of its five ancient Greek cities, the oldest and most important of which, Cyrene, gave its name to the whole region. After the Jabal Akhtar, the African coast turned south in the Gulf of Sirti, shunned by ancient seafarers because of its dangerous sandbanks. The coast of the vast gulf is a flat, featureless territory where the desert reaches the sea. The emptiness of the desert, the absence of ports and the intolerable heat conjure to make this inhospitable land a natural barrier between Cyrenaica and the western part of Libya, Tripolitania. After three or four weeks of travel along this barren coast, an ancient westbound traveller could spot again crops and orchards, especially near the city of Tripoli, defended by strong walls. Still further west, the African coast bends north in what today is Tunisia, the vast coastal region west of the Gulf of Sirti, from Tripolitania to the northeastern modern Algeria, constituted the province of Africa of the ancient Roman Empire, which the Arabs will call Ifriqia. It had been a province of, province of great importance for the ancient Roman Empire. On the ruins of Carthage, once the most formidable rival of Rome, the ancient Romans had eventually rebuilt a large city with imposing public buildings and restored the magnificent artificial port created by the Carthaginians. The position of the city, overlooking the Strait of Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean, had favoured the exports of the region towards the northern shore of shores of the Pacified Sea. Around the beginning of the first millennium, the entire province of Africa had experienced a true economic miracle, accompanied by a considerable demographic growth. The farmland of the province of Africa produced wheat for the Roman Empire and wine, and above all, huge olive trees plantations provided oil, indispensable in the ancient Mediterranean world, both for nutrition and for lighting. This prosperity had created a network of towns and villages in the north of modern-day 
Tunisia. Under the Roman Empire, the region's economy uh, was dominated by landowners, who maintained close ties to Italy, in the capitals of which, first Rome and then Milan and Ravenna, they sent their sons to complete their education and begin careers in the imperial administration. Then, with the empire's decline in the 4th century and the adoption of Christianity as state religion, the large public buildings, temples, baths, theatres, and had been gradually left without maintenance. The economic crisis had gathered around the broad Roman streets of Carthage, and even inside its abandoned circus, the shanties of an impoverished population. In the late Roman Empire, the choice of the emperor and the appointment of the provincial commanders were in the hands of the militaries. The Roman aristocrat had gradually with drawn in their estates, in sumptuous villas decorated with mosaics and statues, adorned with horse tables, pools and ornamental groves, where they hunt the administration of their latifundia and the influence exercised on the territory, territories distracted them from a political decline that they had no way to stop. For what concerns the cultural life, under the late Roman Empire, Africa had suffered not less than Egypt from the impact of religious intolerance. Around the 4th century, the African Christianity had been torn by the conflict between the Catholic Church and the so-called Donatist Church, so named after a bishop of Carthage. From a doctrinal point of view, the differences between the two churches were minimal. The Donatists had not accepted the reinstatement in their ecclesiastical functions of those priests, who, in order to escape the persecution of Diocletians at the beginning of the 4th century, had abjured their faith and consented to the delivery in Latin traditio, of the sacred text to the Roman authorities, who burned them systematically. In other words, the Donatists considered void the sacraments and holy orders granted by the traditores, hence the word traitor, that had been successively forgiven and reintegrated in the Catholic Church. The intransigence of the Donatist became, however, disruptive in a society in which the invalidity of a sacrament could mean a loss of salvation and had serious administrative consequences, invalidity of marriages, of inheritances, etc. The drift between the two communities eventually became a harsh competition for territory. The Donatists were in majority in rural areas, but the Catholic Church eventually prevailed in the early 5th century. By means of the coercion exercised by an imperial edict fostered by the intelligent and pugnacious bishop of the city of Hipporegia, Augustine. Around this great agricultural island in the continent, which now bears its name, Africa, were deserts and wild mountains. Near the borders of the province, the Roman villas assumed the appearance of fortification, guarding fields and plantations from beds of looters. Beyond those borders to the west, in the mountains of Cabilia, of Hodna and of the Ores, Semi-nomadic tribes, tormented by poverty, pressed on the plains with occasional raids. South of the province, the desert nomads lived with their archaic customs. All those surrounding peoples were Berbers, speaking dialects of a language quite different from both Latin and Punic proud of their independence and of their religion, much older than the ancient Roman or the Phoenician polities. Eventually, during the fourth decade of the fifth century, 
i.e. 200 years before the Arab conquest, the province of Africa, in which the Roman military presence had become scarce, dispersed and unpopular for the religious coercion exercise against the Donatists, was rolled over by invaders coming from the west. In the year 429, the Vandal king Gensric or Geiseric had crossed the Strait of Gibraltar with approximately 80,000 Vandal, Goth, and Alan people. This mass of bellicose migrants, including no less than 15,000 fighters, headed for Carthage, spreading terror along the approximately 1,500 kilometers of the way through the provinces of Mauritania, in what is today's northern Morocco, and Numidia, in what is today northern Algeria. In 439, Genseric eventually took Carthage, establishing a kingdom that lasted for a century, and that exercised piracy on a very large scale in the Mediterranean. In 455, Genseric sent a fleet to carry out the most systematic plunder ever suffered by Rome. The Vandal Kingdom in Africa marked at the same time the demise of the Roman ruling class and the end of uh, the region's integration in the Mediterranean world. Even the Catholic clergy was persecuted and sometimes killed. The Vandals were Arians and, unlike the Goths in Italy, not particularly inclined to religious tolerance. Then, in 533, Justinian sent General Belisarius to regain control of the province. The book The Wars of the Byzantine historian Procopius, which I have praised already in Lecture 5, contains an excellent account of this military campaign against the Vandals, which was short and successful for the Byzantines. After their invasion, the Vandals, in order to consolidate their conquest and discourage local rebellions, had torn down the walls of the African cities. Therefore, after suffering an initial defeat by the very experienced troops of Belisarius, they did not manage to organize an effective resistance. Their kingdom, which had adopted the lifestyle of the late Empire Romans, collapsed within a year, and the Byzantines regained the province of Africa to their empire. However, if you read the work of Procopius, you will notice that the narration of the Vandal War is followed by that of another war, tiresome and obstinate against the Berber mountain tribes who had already resisted the Punic and Roman colonizations and even the influence of Christianism. Over the years, the Byzantine armies obtained a couple of victories, but their control of the province remained confined to the coast and to corridors of communications between cities amid savage uplands populated by hostile tribes. The Byzantine had also the handicap of speaking Greek, a language nearly unknown west of the Gulf of Sirte. Even St. Augustine, the greatest African intellectual of the late antiquity, had never managed to master it. Finally, the Eastern Roman Empire could not offer to this region what the Western Roman Empire had given to it, economic ties with Italy, a country of which the Byzantines controlled only a few areas, most of them on the very far Adriatic coast. This was the situation of the Exarchate of Africa. Different from that of the provinces conquered until then by the Arabs, the social fabric of Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia and Egypt had been preserved in spite of the war between the rival empires. It perpetuated lifestyles, techniques and forms of artistic religion and linguistic expression that had been vibrant for centuries. The Arab conquerors managed to insert themselves in this continuity and to profit from it. 
by contrast, in Northern Africa, the long decline of the Roman administration, the Vandal invasion, and the following wars had largely severed the connection with the past civilization. Many cultivated areas had been abandoned to nomadism. The use of the horse had been largely replaced by that of the camel, more suited to arid, uninhabited territory. Even the Christian religion had been forsaken in many rural areas. The Latin and Punic languages had lost very much ground, substituted by Berber dialects. The state control of many areas had been replaced by that of the tribal chiefs of the hills and the deserts, understandably hostile to foreign influences. The Berber tribes, jealous of their traditions and independence, will manage to resist for centuries, even to the Arab domination. As said, the Arab conquest of North Africa began already uh, a few months after the surrender of Alexandria, with a far-reaching expedition accompanied by the blessing of the monophysite patriarch Benjamin, who welcomed the end of the Byzantine domination of Egypt. In 642, the new master of Egypt, Amr bin al-As, rapidly reached the Pentapolis, including its main city, Cyrene, also known as Barca, a city which, with a rich Greek and Roman past, once nicknamed the Athens of Africa for its philosophical school. We don't know exactly what happened there, because the age of the first Arab conquest is poorly documented, but it is likely that the cities of the Pentapolis simply opened the doors to the Arabs and accepted to pay them tributes. Amr, installed in Barca as governor, governor of the area, his own nephew, Uqba bin Nafi, who would become an important figure in the conquest of Northern Africa. Then the Arabs continued their advance along the Libyan coast. In the following year, they took Tripoli by a surprise action, met with very little resistance, and reached Sabratha and left Ismania, after which Am eventually returned to Egypt. In 644, Caliph Umar had died and had been replaced by another companion of the Prophet, Uthman bin Affan who decided to substitute Amr in the position of the governor of Egypt with one of his relatives of the Quraysh tribe. We will return on that in the next lecture, and we will also meet again Amr in another important position for the history of Islam. In the meantime, the political climate of the Exarchate of Africa had been affected by the attempt of Constantinople to impose the monotheistic doctrine. We have seen in the last lecture that in 638 Emperor Heraclius had a fix in the Cathedral of Constantinople and then publicized throughout the empire the ecthesis, a confession of faith stating that the two natures of the Christ, the divine and the human one, had been moved by a single will. In Heraclius' intention, this compromise between orthodox and monophysite positions would help to unify Christianity. The ecthesis reaffirmed the conclusions of the ecumenical council acknowledged by the Roman Church, and indeed, seen from today's perspective, the assertion of a single will might look no big issue, or even look like simple common sense. However, at that time, all sorts of political and social conflicts express themselves through religious controversies, and the reconciliation attempt of Heraclius failed. Firstly, the Roman Pope Honorius I, who had been favorable to the concept of a single will, had died in the same year of the edict, and had been replaced by a Pope hostile to as we have seen in the last lecture, in Egypt the opposition to monothelitism had come from the local monophysites. By contrast, in the area of Carthage, 
uh, which was a stronghold of Chalcedonian Orthodoxy, the resistance to the ecstasies came from an Orthodox monk, author of works of mystical content, Maximus the Confessor. He criticized both the new doctrine and the pretense of the emperor to impose his view upon the religious hierarchy. Upon Maximus' initiative in 646, synods were held in African cities which condemned as heretical diectasis, an act of heavy political significance. The religion strife underwent a further escalation when, in 647, another Roman pope excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople for his support to monotheletism. At this point, the brooding discontent of the African aristocracy caused by the fiscal policy of Constantinople exploded into a rebellion. On the same year, Gregory the Exarch of Carthage broke relationship with Constantinople and proclaimed itself emperor of Africa. He established his residence in the town of Sufetula, today's Baitla, in what is now central Tunisia, to cement his alliance with Berber tribes and avoid being exposed to attacks of the Byzantine fleets. However, he was instead attacked by an Arab expedition sent from Egypt and was defeated in 648 in a pitched battle outside the city in which he he also lost his life. The Arabs went back to Egypt with an immense booty, and the Exarchate of Africa returned for decades under the control of Constantinople. The province of Africa was, however, only one of the fronts of the global conflict between the Caliphate and the Roman Empire. Another war theatre was Anatolia, i.e. the Asiatic portion of modern. Turkey. One of the governors that Caliph Umar had appointed to control conquered territories was that of Damascus, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. He belonged to the wealthy clan of the Umayyads, of the tribe of the Quraysh. His father, Abu Sufyan, had strenuously opposed Muhammad, but after the conquest of Mecca, had eventually become one of his commanders. Another prominent commander of the early caliphate had been Muawiyah's older brother, and Muawiyah himself had gained significant experience of command in battle. He was a good strategist who had transformed the Syrian troops into a strong army by selecting himself the best commanders, by paying regularly the soldiers and improving their equipment, and by introducing siege engines in the army. During the summer season of four consecutive years, from 643 to 647, Muawiyah conducted several incursions into Anatolia on the way followed by the Persian general Sharbaraz, who 20 years before had led his troops to camp on the Bosporus in sight of Constantinople. However, Anatolia was not a region that the Arab light cavalry could conquer as easily as the steppes of Syria or the plains of Mesopotamia. To start with, the Taurus Mountains were a natural barrier to invasions from Syria. Their few passes were guarded, and Arab armies could be either blocked or at least spotted when they crossed into Anatolia. The surprise factor that had favored the Arab raiders when they rushed out of the desert was gone. Secondly, when they advanced in the rugged landscape of Anatolia, the Arabs were exposed to ambushes and found the country empty, the people having retreated into Byzantine fortresses. The rural population of Anatolia included former militaries of the Thebes and their families, people whose military service had been rewarded by land, perfectly trained for warfare and still militarily organized. As we have seen in Lecture 9, 
Each theme was an independent military district with the capacity to carry out military operations and resistance warfare. Already Caliph Umar had said that he would have preferred that God had put a wall of fire between Anatolia and the Caliphate, knowing that the conquest of the peninsula would prove very arduous. In spite of that, Muawiyah managed to conduct deep incursions into Anatolia. In 647, he broke into Cappadocia, his central region, and took the important city of Caesarea, not to be confused with the homonymous city on the coast of Palestine. From there, he advanced further west into Phrygia, and after failing to take the city of Amorium, eventually returned to Damascus with rich booty. Finally, <clears throat> Muawiyah opened a completely new front of the war against the Roman Empire, one that seemed out of reach for the Arab people. He had understood that the war against Rome could not be decided without an adequate fleet. To build an Arab one, he appealed to all the technical and human resources that the Caliphate could offer. It were the Monophysites of Syria and Egypt, as well as the Jacobite Syrian Christians, whom the Orthodox Church had oppressed for decades, who set up and manned the fleet that would attack Constantinople a few years later. Already in 649, Muawiyah himself led a naval expedition that conquered the capital of Cyprus, obtaining the payment of tributes for the Caliphate. After that, he cleverly negotiated with the Byzantine a three years truce, which he used to expand his fleet before resuming naval operations. In 653, he besieged the islands of Rhodes. It was Muawiyah who sold to a Jewish merchant of Homs the bronze fragments of the famous Colossus, which an earthquake had brought down eight centuries before. He also plundered Crete and occupied other Greek islands. The Arab fleet, or more exactly, the fleet commanded by the Arabs, could at that point count already on hundreds of ships. These ominous developments, along with the Arab threat to the Exarchate of Africa, forced the young Emperor Constance II to confront the Arab navy in a major battle in 655, off the southern coast of Turkey, near the city of Phoenicus, today's Phoenicus. In it, he suffered a disastrous defeat and barely saved his own life by exchanging his uniform with that of one of his officers. The battle remained known as the Battle of the Masts, because the sailors of the two fleets had attached the cross and the crescent to the masts of the respective ships. At this point, Muawiyah obtained from Caliph Uthman the permission to attack Constantinople. The history of Europe could have followed a very different course if some unforeseen events had not interrupted the Arab conquests. In 656, the Islamic world faced its first major crisis. Since this crisis had repercussions that are even today under everyone's eye, I will discuss it in the next two lectures. We stop here for today, but we'll be back soon on the Arab conquest of North Africa and the Mediterranean, before going to Spain and to the Frankish kingdoms, and eventually returning to Italy, this time in the 8th century. Thanks to those who have joined my YouTube channel and to those uh, who post their interesting questions and suggestions. 
some of you are almost like old friends for me now and I'm happy to be in touch with you with a new clip or with a comment on the channel. Bye for now and a presto!